have unity in the church, a couple of things that you should not do in order to not or in order to make sure that we're not causing disunity, but then also things that we should do to make sure that we keep unity within the church and among brethren. So I'm going to be preaching a couple of sermons about having unity in the church, and I'm going to start off with the subject of unity in doctrine or unity in the faith. I want you to look with me at Ephesians chapter number four, which is going to be our text here. We're going to read this and, and then I want to touch on uh, an introduction quickly. Ephesians chapter number four, look at verse number uh, 11. It says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So to build up the body of Christ, the church. Look at verse 13. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So I want you to notice that what this particular verse, what this section of verse is talking about is the importance of having unity in the faith. Having unity and the goal of our church is all the pastors and teachers, all the ministries, all the work of this particular church and what our ultimate goal is because of that is that we would have unity in the faith. That we would all come into the same unity or have the same unity in belief or faith. Now, first off in the introduction, I want to talk about the importance of uh, brethren, importance of unity with brethren and the relationships that you can build. Now, anyone who has spent, in which that would be everyone, of course, because we all didn't come out of the womb, you know, a child of God, uh, you know, and saved. But all of us have spent time in the world. All of us have, have experienced relationships with those that are not saved, with the world, with with, you know, different types of friends and things that we grew up with. And I know that I can testify in my life that the greatest relationships that I've ever had are with brothers and sisters in Christ. And not only can I give you that personal uh, testimony from myself, but I can also tell you that that's what the Bible teaches repeatedly. The Bible emphasizes the relationships that you have with your brothers and sisters in Christ, even over the relationships that you can have with your own family, even over the relationships that you can have with just people that you grew up with in your own life. Psalm chapter number 133 verse number 1 says this, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. So the Bible emphasizes unity. The Bible emphasizes ha having unity and the importance of unity and how sweet and how good and how pleasant it says, particularly in that verse. It's a great thing to have unity in the church. So we need to look at, in the Bible, what are the different ways in which we can have unity? What are the different ways in which that we can, we can uh, uh, you know, grow in the faith and grow in unity in the Lord Jesus Christ? Now, I want you to turn with me quickly to Jude. Go to the book of Jude. I'm going to give you three points of how we should have unity and how brethren and, and uh, you know, sisters in Christ have unity and where our unity begins. Now, the general reason of why we all have unity today is because we all believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's because we all have the same Savior. We, what we have in common is salvation. We all believe in the gospel. I want you to look with me at Jude, the book of Jude. Obviously, there's uh, only one chapter here. Jude, let's, uh, we'll begin in verse number one. The Bible says, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. I want you to notice what Jude said there in verse number 3. He said, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of, he says this, the common salvation. Now where all of our unity begins today is with a common salvation. Is that we all have the same Savior. What brings all all of us together today is the fact that we all believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We all have this relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And what that does is obviously, you know, the Bible tells us as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. So at the moment that I put my faith in Christ, I was born again into the child. I was born again into the family of God and became a child of God. Now everyone else that believes in the Lord Jesus Christ and becomes a child of God, you know what they are? 
They are my brethren. They are now born into that family as well. And they are my, either my brothers or they are my sisters in Christ. So that right there is where our relationship begins. That is where unity begins. And without this aspect of unity, without this particular you know, element of unity, we can't have unity. This is actually the introduction to unity. This is the beginning of unity. Now, here's just the blunt truth. I don't have anything in common with the Jehovah's Witness. I don't have anything in common with a Mormon. I don't have anything in common with a Pentecostal or with a Church of Christ member. You know why? Because we don't even have salvation in common. We don't even have the gospel in common. We don't even have the foundation. That is the foundation of our Christian lives. The foundation of our Christian lives is it starts with the fact that we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are born again and now we become a child of God. Now we're a Christian. A Jehovah's Witness is not a Christian. A Catholic is not a Christian. Why? Because they don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. They're not putting their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. If we look around at all the religions today, and even the majority of denominations of Christianity, they believe the way to get to heaven is by being a good person. They believe that the way to get to heaven is by being good, by going to church, by, you know, uh, uh, by meriting your way into heaven, by baptism, by all of these things, right? That's not what the Bible teaches. That's not the way to get to heaven. That is not salvation. And the salvation, and the sal of the, if we look at the Bible, if we look at the message of the Bible, the core message of the Bible is pointing to what? It's pointing to the cross. It's pointing to the message of salvation. So if, if, if I am you know, uh, speaking with you know, a Jehovah's Witness and we can't even agree on salvation, the core message, the essential teaching that everything in the Bible teach or points to, how can I have anything in common or how can I have any unity with a Jehovah's Witness? How can I have any unity with a Catholic? Now, do we hate them? No, we want them to have unity with us. We want them to be our brothers and sisters in Christ. We want them to you know, uh, understand that all of their righteousnesses are as filthy rags and that they have to put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We want them to be our brethren, but are they our brethren? No. We don't even have the foundation as the same. Now, yeah, I realize that they preach Jesus Christ. I realize that they say, hey, we believe in Jesus Christ, right? But the Bible warns us of another Jesus. The Bible, and it's like people forget about this, that the Bible actually talks about this. Paul warns in two different places in the New Testament of another Jesus, of people preaching another Jesus. A Jesus, they're saying that they believe in the Jesus of the Bible, but it's another Jesus. He warns of another gospel where people are, they say that they believe the gospel, they say that they believe the good news, but what do they believe in really? What is the, the perversion of the gospel? They're adding to the grace of Christ. They're adding and saying, hey, you know, you have to be a good person in order to get to heaven. You have to do this. You have to do that. They're trusting and they're trying to mix their own righteousness in with that is what they're trying to do. And I realize, you know, they talk, that some of them will talk about the Holy Spirit even, but the Bible warns of another spirit. So if we don't have the same foundation, if we don't have the same salvation, how can we have unity with these other you know, denominations with these other people. We want to have unity with them, but they must get saved first. Even a Jehovah's Witness, we don't believe in the same Jesus. You know, a Jehovah's Witness does not believe that Jesus is God. They believe that He was just a man. Jesus Christ said, if ye believe not that I am He, ye shall die in your sins. That's what Jesus said. So if you don't believe that He's He, you know, He said, before Abraham was, I am. So he's clearly saying that he is the Lord. He is Jehovah of the Old Testament. Amen. So they believe in a Jesus that is not the Jesus of the Bible. So what brings us together here and brings us all unity here as opposed to those that maybe claim Christianity and aren't saved or maybe those that you know, will go to a Kingdom Hall or a Church of Christ? What's the difference? It's because we have a common salvation. When Jude wrote to them, the people that he was writing to, they all believed the same gospel. They all had a common salvation. They were all saved. That's where our unity must begin. So when we speak of the unity within a church, we're going to have unity within a church, we all have to believe the right gospel. We all have to be saved and we have to have a common salvation. So that's point number one. That's where the unity is going to begin within the church. It's going to begin with a common salvation. It's going to begin with all of us believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Acts chapter number 2, verse number 44 says this, And all that believed were together and had all things common. So I want you to notice that all that believed 
were together. So what brought them together? What uh, enabled them to be able to come together and to have that unity? It was that, it was that all of them believed, that they all had their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for their salvation. It's that they had a common salvation. Now secondly, the second point is, we all need to have the same Bible. This is very, very important. We all need to have the same Bible. And I want to say this as well. Go to John chapter number 1. This is just as important, this is just as foundational as having the same gospel. This is just as foundational and just as important as having the same gospel. If we're going to have unity within the church, with va within Valiant Baptist Church, if we're going to have that unity, we all have to have the same Bible. We all have to have the right Bible. Now, there are a lot of people out there that, you know, would, would uh, churches that would just say, hey, you can use whatever Bible you want. Now, obviously, we don't force anyone in our church to use a certain Bible, but if we're going to have unity, you need to have the right Bible. What Bible is that? It's the King James Bible. We have to have God's Word. Now, we believe that God has preserved His Word unto us this day, unto us, unto this generation. Psalm chapter number 12, verse number 6 and 7 says, For the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. And then David says this, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Talking about the words. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them unto this generation and forever. So God promises that He's going to preserve His Word all the way unto this generation, the generation that He lived, and then also to forever, to the point of forever. Jesus said, He said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. So, but the Bible very clearly teaches that God has preserved His Word. I'll give you another verse, Isaiah. You know, the Lord is speaking to Isaiah, and He tells me, He says, My words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed, from henceforth, saith the Lord, and forever. Over and over and over again, God promises to preserve His Word. And you may ask the question, you know, how can this be as foundational as the Gospel? How is all of us using the King James Bible, all of us using the same Bible as foundational as the, the message of salvation or as the message of the Gospel? Well, let me ask you this question. How do you know about the Gospel? Where do you get the message of the Gospel from? You get it from your Bible, don't you? You get it from God's Word. Well, if we all have different Bibles, then we're all going to have different messages. We're all going to have, you know, different Gospels, if you will. Now, in John chapter number 1, John chapter number 1, let me get there myself. It's a very famous verse. There's a great truth that's taught in John chapter number 1, verse number 1. The Bible says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God. So we're taught a very deep, you know, uh, uh, truth here about God and about His Word. And the Bible says that God is His Word. You know, of course, this is the teaching of the Trinity. God is His Word and the Word is God. So we can see the importance of God's Word. Amen. We can see the importance of God's Word. And what is the Gospel? It's us trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's us trusting in God. Now, obviously, as I said before, we all have to have the same Jesus. That, that ties in with salvation. We all have to have the same Jesus. We all have to have the same gospel. Well, the Bible teaches that Jesus is God and Jesus is the Word. That's why I said these are just as foundational one to the other because Jesus is the Word and the Word is Jesus. So we have to make sure we have the right Jesus. If we have the right Jesus, we'll have the right Word of God. Now, people will look at King James only as oftentimes and they'll say that you're divisive. You know, we feel like you're causing disunity because you're, all, you're saying that everyone has to have, you know, the same Bible. No, we're actually bringing about unity. Those that believe in the King James Bible are bringing about unity amongst the body of Christ. Can you imagine, you know, every single person in here? Let's just say that, that every seat was filled and that every person in here had a different Bible. Can you imagine the disunity? Can you imagine every person in here having a different Bible and I stood up here and just started reading my text and Brother Hall said something different than Brother Rick's did and Brother Rick said something different than maybe the visitor or maybe you know, one of the ladies back there. Can you imagine how you know, confusing and, and how we all you know, should be studying our Bibles to show ourselves approved and we're all reading different texts so we're all coming away with different understandings of what it says. 
And we're all having different you know, uh, 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 beliefs about different subjects. Because why? Because we all have a different Bible. Right. Now, do you think that that would bring unity or disunity if we all used a different Bible? Of course, disunity. So you see the importance of using the same Bible, and specifically, even more importantly, not only just using one Bible, but using the correct Bible, using the King James Bible. God's Word brings about unity. So that is the second point, and that is just as foundational as the, uh, as the uh, first point of salvation, the common salvation, because we only know of the message of salvation from the Bible itself. Uh, the New King James Version in Matthew chapter number 7, verse number 13. You go to Matthew 7, 13 in your Bible, in the King James Bible. And I'm going to read to you from the New King James in Matthew chapter number 7, verse number 13. I want to show you why this matters so much and how it is just as foundational to the message of the gospel. Jesus likens salvation unto drinking a glass of water. Jesus likens salvation unto stepping through a door. There's only one step of salvation, right? Jesus likens salvation unto eating a piece of bread. Over and over again, he compares it or parallels it with, with a, a very simple task. Why? Because salvation is easy. It's easy to be saved. The Bible's very clear. It's easy to be saved. Jesus did the hard work. Jesus, you know, was the one. Jesus said, you know, uh, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So Jesus actually tells us, hey, we're laboring. You know, our life is hard. You know, trying to get to heaven all on your own is extremely difficult. So what we do is we just cast all of our cares upon Him when it comes to salvation. He bears all of our burdens and He took all of our punishment for us. Amen. And salvation is, is easy. The, Bible, the question is asked one time in the Bible, very clearly. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's simple. That's easy. Salvation's easy. But you know, the, the New King James makes it hard. The New King James you know, presents a different idea of what the gospel is. I want you to look at Matthew chapter number 7, verse number 13, and I'm going to read to you from the New King James Version. It says this, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Then it says this in verse 14, Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Now, did you notice, there are, of course, a few different words that are moved around and different, but did you notice the major difference? Where it actually teaches something entirely different in Matthew chapter 7, verse number 14, in the New King James Version. It actually is telling you, and of course, Jesus is talking about the way into life, the way to get everlasting life, the way to get to heaven. And Jesus is explaining his point of 13 and 14 in the real Bible, in King James Bible, is that not many people get saved. Not many people will make it to heaven. But he's not talking about how it's hard. He's not talking at all about how it's difficult. And in the King James Bible, it says, it says this, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. His whole point is that few are going in. And he's just repeating himself when he says, straight is the gate. You know, that's straight as in narrow. And then he just repeats it again and says, narrow is the way. But the New King James Version says, because narrow is the gate, and then it says, and difficult is the way. That's heresy. That, that does not bring about unity from one person using a King James Bible and then another person using a New King James. One person's going to walk away and think that salvation's difficult. Salvation's hard. Maybe a person might be even discouraged by that if they're not saved themselves. But the other person is going to understand, hey, the Bible's just teaching that just few people find it. The Bible's just teaching that, you know, not many people are going to make it to heaven. That's all that it's saying. You know, the Bible's very clear that salvation is very easy. It's by grace that we're saved, and it's by mercy that we're saved, and all we have to do is put our faith in Christ. This passage has nothing to do with the gospel, you know, uh, uh, being difficult or the way in which we get to heaven being difficult. That's not what this is talking about at all. So notice how this would bring disunity if we're all using different Bibles. And how it would, it would confuse one another and it wouldn't bring us together. We would all have different messages. We would all even to, a, to an extent have a different gospel if that was the case. So we need to have number two, or my second point this morning, was we need to all have the same word of God in order to have unity. Point number one, we have to have the common salvation. 
We have to all have the same Jesus. We all have to have the same gospel, the same message of salvation. Point number two, again, is that we all have to have the same Word of God. We all have to have the same Bible. I want you to turn with me to Titus chapter number one. Titus chapter number one. And the title of the sermon was Unity in Doctrine. Unity in Doctrine. Number one, the message of salvation is a doctrine. The message of salvation is a doctrine. The doctrine of salvation. Doctrine just means teaching. Right? So in that sense, we have to have the same doctrine, right? With the gospel. That will bring about unity. Point number two, we have to have the same Bible in order to have the same doctrine. So, because we want to all come to the unity of the faith, right? Remember Ephesians chapter number four, that's what we desire. We want to come to the unity of the faith. That's the result, right? That's where we want to be in the end. That's what Ephesians chapter number four teaches. Now the word faith in the Bible, it doesn't always refer to just our faith in Christ and just our faith referring to our salvation. Sometimes it's referring to just what we believe in general it, doctrinally on the subject of doctrines. It's kind of like this. You know, uh, different churches have statements of faith. Now, is that only about what they believe about salvation? No, it's what they believe doctrinally in, in all different areas, right? This, their statements of faith. They're their statement of faith. So the word faith is not always in the Bible also. It's not always just referring to our faith in Christ or the faith that is supplied in order to, 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 to uh, uh, receive salvation at the moment that we are saved. The word faith oftentimes in the Bible is just referring to, uh, like Ephesians 4, that we all come to the unity in the faith, right? It's our belief doctrinally. Sometimes it's just referring to doctrines that we hold. Just our faith in general of what we believe, right? Well, here in Titus chapter number 1, verse number 4, we can see that very similarly. Look at Titus chapter number 1, verse number 4. It says, To Titus, mine own son after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. I want you to go back to Ephesians chapter number 4. We all need to come into and have the common faith. This is point number three. We all have to have the common doctrine. We all have to have the common faith in order to grow in to unity, in order to have unity. Here in Ephesians chapter number 4, we see this t taught much clearer about what it's referring to when it speaks of faith. Now, as I said, the whole chapter, Ephesians chapter number 4, speaks of unity. And it speaks of different ways in which we can have unity. Ephesians chapter 4, where we read before, verses uh, uh, you know, 11 through 13 there, we're going to read it again. But it speaks of how we all want to ultimately, in the end, we want to grow and have unity in the faith in all areas. That's what we want to do. We all want to grow in our Christian lives and we want to learn more. Now, when you look at a lot of church splits and you look at a lot of disfellowshipping, oftentimes, do you know what it comes from? It, co it can come from a lot of different areas, but very often it comes from doctrinal disagreements. That's a very common uh, reason why churches will split, is doctrinal disagreements, because they disagree with maybe what the pastor believes, maybe not even what the pastor believes, maybe with just what a majority of people you know, believe. Sometimes the majority may disagree with what the pastor believes, right? And, or maybe just a few people may you know, disagree with whatever, you know, whoever in the church, right? And the church will do what? The church will split or there will be disfellowshipping. So what was keeping them together prior to that in that sense? It was the unity of their faith within that doctrine, wasn't it? It was the unity of faith that they all believed the same thing, right? That they all had the same beliefs on that specific doctrine. That's what was keeping them you know, unified or that's what was keeping them you know, in the singleness of the faith and in, uh, you know, uh, that particular area. Now, here in Ephesians chapter number 4, Ephesians chapter number 4, I'm going to read these scriptures. This is actually going to be the last scriptures that we read here in Ephesians chapter number 4, and then I'll make a couple other points and, and we'll, we'll conclude the sermon. Ephesians chapter number 4, verse number 11, it tells us this. He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. And then it says this, for the perfecting of the saints. What's the reason? So that the saints can be perfected, right? For the work of the ministry. And then here's the overall reason, <clears throat> excuse me, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith. So what are we all seeking after? What, are we, what, what is the desirable you know, a, a, a destination for all of us? It's that we all want to come into the unity of 
the faith. Now that's not only talking about the unity of our salvation. Obviously we all believe the same thing. We have the common salvation. We all believe the same on the gospel. If you don't believe the same on the gospel, you're not in the faith at all. But it's the unity of the faith, just the teachings of the Bible. We all desire to come into the unity of the faith. You know, the, the closer that a church is to the truth and everyone believing the truth and, and everyone holding that doctrine, there's going to be a greater unity within that church. There's going to, everyone's going to have a greater unity. The more that you have in common with someone, the, more, the better you're going to get along with that particular person, whoever that may be, right? In any area of life. But the greatest relationships that we can have is the relationship that we have with another brother and sister in Christ. So often, maybe when you're out you know, door knocking and soul winning and you knock on someone's door and the person answers, you know, sometimes just immediately you can know before you even ask them the questions about salvation. You know, do you know you're saved? You know, do you know for sure you're, if you die today you'd go to heaven? Sometimes I can even just sense sometimes when people are saved. When they start giving me the answers, I can tell. Because there's this automatic just unity that, that is there between a brother and a sister in Christ or a brother and a brother in Christ. And we both have the same spirit. And when you start talking and, and when we agree more so even doctrinally, what happens? You get along better with that person. There's even a greater unity with that person. Well, if a church is unified around salvation, if a church is unified around the same Bible, and if a church is unified around sound doctrine and right doctrine, that church will ultimately have great unity. So when it comes to unity in the faith or unity in doctrine, these are all doctrines. This is how we all are going to come to a greater unity within the body of Christ. Just finish reading verse number 13. It says this, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now we desire to come to that perfect man, under the measure and stature of Jesus Christ. And this is the point that I want to I end on. Is everyone, is anyone, I worded that wrongly, is anyone ever going to, to grow unto the measure and the stature of Jesus Christ? Is anyone ever going to, 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 to get to the point as an individual where you come to the measure and the stature of Jesus Christ? Where you meet up to what Jesus Christ met up to? Are you ever going to excel to that point in your life? No. It's never going to happen. That's our, that is our, our goal. And that's what we should desire. We should always look to Jesus. Right? We should always look to Him as our example. That's what that's saying. Jesus should be our example and we should desire to continually grow to the measure and the stature of Christ. And we should be continually getting sin out of our life. We should be continually becoming more Christ-like every day. But is anyone going to ever die where they're just never committing sins? Do you think there's anyone that's ever going to end their life where they're right about every single doctrine in the Bible? Every single doctrine, every single interpretation of the entire Bible, they just understand it and know all of it. Do you think there's anyone that does that or, or, or can't or will ever do that? No. No. It's not going to happen. You, you know, every person, this church will never be right about every single doctrine. We never will be. No one will be right about every single doctrine that the Bible teaches. Why? Because we're all sinners. That's why. Because we have, you know, in 1 Corinthians, uh, I believe it's chapter number 13 at the very end, the charity chapter, he talks about how we look through, right now we look through a glass darkly. And how there's many things right now we, we don't understand. You know, but we will understand those things later. There's a lot of things in the Bible that we're not going to understand. This is an infinite book. It's God, you know, God's ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts, you know, than our thoughts, right? We're never going to understand every single thing in, in the Bible. So my teaching, you know, when it comes to unity of doctrine that we all have to believe the exact same thing and you better agree with the pastor, you better agree with the rest of the church on every single subject, that's not what I'm teaching. We're all going to disagree on things. And you know what? That's all right. That shows you're thinking for yourself is what that shows. That shows that you're studying the Bible for yourself. You know, when Paul was preaching to the, you know, he's preaching to the uh, Bereans, it said these were more noble than those in Thessalonica. And it said in that they searched the word, they received it with all readiness of, of mind, but they, that also they searched the word of God. Right, to see if those things were so. They search the scriptures to see if those things are so. When I preach, you need to be searching the scriptures. You need to be thinking, is what he's preaching correct? Right? 
And you know what? We, we all have the same Spirit of God, but we all have our own flesh. And we all make our own decisions. And you're not going to agree with everything that I say. You're never going to find a church where you agree with every single thing that the pastor says and every single thing that every person in the church... If, if you find somewhere, you know, some church like that, you're probably going to end up in Guyana. That's not good. If every single person, you know, agrees with the same things and nobody disagrees and everybody's on the exact same page with the pastor, that's not good, right? You know, but what we desire is to come to and we should be growing in doctrine to come more so every day in the unity of the faith. We should all be learning our Bibles more. We should all be reading our Bibles more. We should all be learning new things from the, the preaching, from church, and we should all be, you know, maybe correcting errors that we have in our life. Our life is a continual purging of things we're wrong about, whether it be in practice and sins that we're getting out of our life, or whether it be beliefs and faith and doctrine that we hold that we're wrong about and tweaking things. You know, I'm constantly correcting little, you know, minutia things about things that I believe and noticing, well, that wasn't exactly right. You know, maybe this is a little bit, you know, better, you know, uh, based upon this verse. Or maybe I noticed something that I never noticed that kind of changes the way that I look at a passage or maybe even a, an interpretation of a story that I'm reading in the Bible. So we're all going to be growing, you know, individually. Uh, as, as individuals are going to be growing in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But what we desire is we desire, and this is going to bring about great unity, to come in the unity of the faith. To keep correcting our doctrine as we grow older. And we need to have a sincere heart. That's what we need to have. We need to have a humble heart. So that we see it in the Word of God or we hear it from you know, the pulpit. We correct these things. We correct our doctrine when we're wrong about these things. Amen. And we need to continually you know, purge out these wrong doctrines. Because you know what? Three things are very foundational when it comes to the, the, having a common faith and bringing about unity. Number one, salvation. That's where it begins. We all have to have the same salvation. We all have to have the same Jesus. We all have to have the same gospel. Right? We can't have anything. In, we, can't even, we can't even begin the relationship. The Bible is very clear that you're not, to, you know, you're not to be yoked up. You know, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. You know, and then he goes on, for what righteousness, you know, what, what, uh, you know, what does you know, Belial have in common with Christ? Nothing, right? So we have to first start there. Number two, we all have to have the same Bible. We have to have the same Word of God you know, in order to have great unity, in order to grow in unity. Number three, we have to have unity in the faith. We have to have unity in doctrine. And we need to continually be growing in our unity with doctrine. Are we always going to agree on everything? No. It's not going to happen. But you know what? When we all keep correcting our doctrine and, and tuning it in and everybody's on the same page, we're going to get along better. And we're going you know, to have greater unity. But there's something that helps us. I want you to go to Ephesians chapter number 4 to re, uh, verse number 3. Something that helps us to retain unity even when we disagree. And this goes for all areas of life. Let's read verse 2 and 3. Ephesians 4, 2 and 3. It says, With all lowliness and meekness. So that's being humble, right? And long-suffering. That's putting up with other people. Being patient and putting up with people. Forbearing one another in love. That's again, to forbear something is to kind of put up with it. To be long-suffering in love. And then it's repeated in verse 3. Endeavoring to keep the unity. Now what does it mean to endeavor? Work hard at something. It's not just working. It, that's a perfect definition. You're striving. You're working hard at this. So we need to continually be endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. Now watch this. In the bond of peace. Now what bonds us together? There's unity there, but what's going to keep the bond together? Peace. Now, the Bible has a strong teaching repeatedly, and I, I preach a sermon about this, about being a peacemaker. And how we should seek peace and ensue it. We ourselves should be peacemakers. You know what you need to do? You need to forbear one another. You need to be long-suffering. You need to be patient. You need to be forgiving. When it comes to anything, and also doctrine, when you, someone disagrees with you doctrinally, you need to forbear it. You need to be long-suffering. You need to just overlook it. Right? You can't just be hung up that people disagree with you on things. You can't be just hung up that everybody... Now, of course, some of the things we have to have you know, uh, the same. We have to be on the same page about, right? Like, you know, the fundamentals of the faith. We stand for the fundamentals of the faith. The fundamentals of the faith we all have to have in common. You know, that could cause... That could break you know, our unity, couldn't it? You know, if somebody doesn't believe in the virgin birth, if somebody doesn't believe in hell or even heaven... 
I mean, these are, you know, fundamentals of the faith, aren't they? They're very basic teachings of the Bible. But do we have to agree on every little small thing? Of course not, and we're never going to. So you know what you need to do? You need to be a peacemaker. You need to be a person that's willing to forgive, willing to overlook things, to be long-suffering and to forbear and to put up with other people, right? You know, we're, or, or, you, know uh, you may not think I'm pleasant, pleasant, I don't think you're pleasant, right? You know, there are times when we're, when we're, when we're not going to agree on things. Right. There are times when, you know, we're, you know, we're going to be, you know, uh, uh, in a bad mood or whatever it may be, right? Or there are times when one person may get heated or something like that in an argument or in a debate. But you know what you do? You forbear it. You be long-suffering. You overlook it. And you know what allows you to, uh, to, to overlook it? You know what characteristic will allow you to forbear? With all lowliness and meekness of mind. Humility. That's what allows you to be able to overlook things. Right. What prevents you from overlooking something or moving on when someone's done you wrong is pride. Is not possessing humility. That's what stops you. So with all lowliness and meekness of mind, I believe it used the word meekness, didn't it? Yeah, meekness. And then it says with long suffering. Notice that. With long suffering. So in order to, you know, to, to be long suffering and to forbear, you're gonna have to be, you know, a humble. You're gonna have to have lowliness of mind to be able to overlook things. Right? And it says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So that's how he starts off this chapter, which, which is just basically geared toward unity. He goes on, this is the famous chapter, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all, right? We have so many different things in common. We all have the same spirit. You know, you have to have, that ties in with the common salvation because that is the, you know, the, uh, our, our down payment. That's the earnest of the inheritance. You know, we, we, you know, we all you know, uh, have the same spirit. So that helps us to have unity, right? So there's all these things you know, that, that we have in common that, that begin the relationship. But it's never going to be a perfect world until, it's never going to be, as I said a couple of weeks ago, we're never going to have perfect peace until the Prince of Peace is here, right? But what we need to do when there's disagreements, what we need to do when somebody doesn't, you know, just on, on small minutia, when someone doesn't agree with us on doctrine, you know what you need to do? Be long-suffering and forbear it. Who cares if they don't agree with you? Maybe you're wrong. That's a possibility. Right. Maybe you're wrong. You know, maybe you are right. Maybe you know for a fact that you're right. Maybe it's something very clear, right? You know what you do? You just forbear. You just be long-suffering. You just say, oh well. Hopefully they'll, you know, and, and maybe if it's a doctrine that you, you, you want them to be right on for whatever reason, then maybe pray for them. You know, and, but, but oh, this is what you do though, overall. This is what your behavior is in that relationship. You forbear it. You're long-suffering. You're a peacemaker. We have to, if we're going to have unity, and it doesn't matter if it's unity in the faith, unity in any area, right? Ultimately, nothing's going to be perfect. No one's going to be exactly the same when it comes to the faith. No one's going to be exactly the same when it comes to doctrine. So you've got to be able to look over things. You, you yourself have to make sure that you're the peacemaker. If we're going to have a church you know, that, uh, that's, that's filled with just people that just get along great and have great unity, do you know what all those people are going to have to be? Peacemakers. Right. They're all going to have to be peacemakers. Amen. So we want to have unity. And we want to have unity in the faith. And the three points are this. Common salvation. We have to have the common Bible. Unity in salvation. Unity with the Bible. And then also unity in doctrine. That's what we desire. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your word. We thank you for salvation. We thank you for uh, this church here, dear God. Uh, we ask you that you would help us to be a light unto the city of Jacksonville, a, a beacon for them. We ask you that you would uh, bless every person that is here today, dear Lord God. Bless uh, uh, um, uh, the city of Jacksonville. Help us to uh, win many souls, dear Lord God. Help us to have great unity within the church and help us all to have a, a good heart and a sincere heart and search the scriptures and just Guide us with your spirit that we all may uh, come into the unity of the faith. We love you so much and we thank you for the sacrifice of your son. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.